As dawn breaks on January 8, 1815, the cold New Orleans swamps come alive. The British Army, led by General Edward Pakenham, is preparing for a full frontal attack. Their target, the well-entrenched American troops of Major General Andrew Jackson. The British await the first shots. The British have become very impatient. One of the reasons they decide to go on the 8th is based on the fact of British morale being seen to start to drop a little, or even a lot. The men have had several aborted attempts at the wall and been called back. They've been enduring this cold weather, living out in the open, um, enduring harassing artillery fire constantly. So they're ready to go. They want to get in there, in this thing, take the position, be victorious as they always have been, and get it over with. The main British attack will be by a column of companies. Major General Samuel Gibbs, a veteran of action from South Africa to Canada to Gibraltar, will make the main attack on Jackson's left with 2,500 men. A much smaller force will attempt to flank Jackson's riflemen in the wooded swamp, while other troops hit Jackson's right. Reinforcements are set to hit the center of the fray, while a detachment of British troops will cross the Mississippi River, attacking the less well-defended American entrenchments there. Their plan, to block the artillery from firing on the British, and then to capture the guns and turn them on Jackson's own flank. One regiment, the 44th Foot, is assigned as an advance force, which will deliver the ladders and cane bundles to the front, allowing the advance lines to breach the ditch and scale the breastworks that protect Jackson's troops. Andrew Jackson has some 3,800 fighting men on the line behind his stout breastworks, four men deep in most spots. There are now nine well-serviced artillery positions and 1,200 men held in reserve. A blanket of early morning fog carpets the battlefield. In the American lines, they know an attack is imminent. The one thing that is very important in the American lines is morale. They believe they have beaten the British twice. The Americans are ready. The morale is good. They've learned they can depend on each other. They've fought together for the past two weeks. But the size of the opposing force is daunting. One Kentucky militiaman later claims to have seen the wings of the angel of death in the clouds above Chalmette that day. At last, General Pakenham orders the advance. Jackson's artillery responds. Over the breastworks comes the sound of English drums, fifes, and bagpipes. In response, the band of the Creole Battalion d'Orléans strikes up the tune Yankee Doodle and the French Marseille. But now Pakenham's plan begins to unravel. The troops sent to attack the American West Bank become mired in mud. They are struggling to reach the opposite bank of the river. As the fog begins to lift, the first British column appears. The battle-hardened Colonel Rennie and his light infantry bear down on a small American redoubt of Jackson's line and overrun it. They attacked. They got in. They actually got the majority of their men inside there. Most of his men were either killed or captured. Very few that got inside the American works were able to get away. Meanwhile, the scaling ladders and cane bundles necessary for the main force to bridge Jackson's line have been left behind in the confusion, thanks to a nervous and inattentive colonel. The main column begins to falter. And instead of an attack that's pouring over the American breastworks, there's a, a mass of humanity that comes to a grinding halt. 
in front of it, and in front of the cannon, and in front of muskets and rifles. All they had to do was get in behind the line Jackson. But it wasn't going to happen. The British main column is now in range of American rifles and muskets. Jackson gives the order. They are near enough now, gentlemen. You may fire when ready. The whole of the American battle line explodes into a wall of flame and lead, as described by one of the surviving British officers. The enemy no sooner got us within 150 yards of their works than a most destructive and murderous fire was opened on our column of round, grape, musketry, rifle, and buckshot along the course and length of our line in front, as well as on our left flank. Another British officer recounts the fate of the 44th Regiment literally swept from the face of the earth in less time than one can write it. The ground was so wet and the groundwater so high that the few fortifications they could throw up were so weak and so small that the American artillery on their more firmer entrenchments were able to pound it to pieces. The stalwart Highlanders are ordered to march diagonally right in front of the American line of fire and they obey unflinchingly. They had missed a lot of the carnage and a lot of the uh, activity in the Napoleonic Wars, but it gave them a certain discipline and conduct that a lot of the others didn't have. The last word was to halt, so that's what they did. They stood there. One American observer described them as immovable and solid as a brick wall. moved to tears, watching row after row of gallant Highlander mown down. senior British officers are now wounded or dead. General Pakenham himself rides to the front to rally his troops. Suddenly, his horse is raked with grape shot. As he tries to remount another horse, he is shot a second time. He will die almost instantly. The second in command, General Gibbs, is also fatally wounded. General John Lambert, one of the few surviving officers, surveys the carnage in front of him and orders a retreat. Unlike the popular song uh, of recent days, the British did not exactly turn around and run away. They fought right at that rampart until they could fight no more. They then withdrew. Across the river, the small British force makes the ill-equipped and poorly led Americans there flee. It is too small and too late an advantage to be exploited by the British. They look over at the East Bank and they see that it's all over. Doesn't matter how quick they've been, the battle on the East Bank was quicker. But on the main battlefield, the British Army has suffered an unexpected and devastating defeat. The American casualties on the east bank of the Mississippi during the Battle of Chalmette are, are, are almost uh, very small. There are only 13. Uh, six, six men are killed, seven are wounded. In comparison, the British lose over 2,000 men, uh, almost a third of their attacking force, in probably less than 20 minutes of heavy fighting. Among the British dead are two major generals, eight colonels and lieutenant colonels six majors, 18 captains, and 54 junior officers. American casualties in the battle are minuscule by comparison. Jackson himself is astounded. As he later recounts, 
I never had so grand and awful an idea of the resurrection as when I saw more than 500 Britons emerging from the heaps of their dead comrades all over the plain, rising up and coming forward as prisoners. On January 8, 1815, on the plains of Chalmette, Louisiana, outnumbered almost two to one, Andrew Jackson and a hodgepodge army of Americans from varied class, ethnic, and racial backgrounds win one of the most lopsided victories in military history against the most powerful army in the world. It is a victory that will change the face of American politics and shape America's reputation as a force finally to be reckoned with. When the dawn breaks on the morning of January 9th, 1815, it is over. In the light of the British defeat, a truce is declared. Some of the Americans accept the grim task of helping the British with their dead and wounded. The bodies of General Pakenham and General Gibbs are eviscerated and preserved in rum barrels for transport back to England for burial. One British lieutenant describes the grim aftermath. Of all the sights I have ever witnessed, that which met me there was beyond comparison the most shocking and most humiliating. Within the narrow compass of a few hundred yards were gathered together nearly a thousand bodies, all of them arrayed in British uniforms. British reaction upon discovering that their loss came nearly two weeks after peace had been declared can only be imagined. But on the American side, the news does not diminish the sense of triumph. Many consider the battle as the ending battle of the War of 1812. The war has been over because we signed the Treaty of Ghent. This is not true. The treaty is not active until it's ratified by the Congress. Had the Americans lost the Battle of New Orleans, there's a possible chance that the treaty might not have been ratified and the war might have continued. So the victory at New Orleans guaranteed the ratification of that signed treaty. So technically, had the British been able to conquer New Orleans as they had planned, thus placing a stranglehold on the American West, then they could have dictated peace terms because they held the key to the center of the continent. For Americans, this final, decisive victory against two-to-one odds and against the army that bested Napoleon feeds a groundswell of new national pride. What it did for a very divided United States at the end of that war is it helped bind it back together. Here, this tremendously diverse force of people who had never seen each other, who spoke at least three different languages, were brought together to stop the most powerful army in the world from capturing the city of New Orleans. It reaffirmed Americans' belief in their selves, in what the American experiment was to be. that it could develop into something very, very important. Many of the Americans who fought at New Orleans are swept into positions of power, becoming governors, congressmen, legislators, and judges. Most of the American allies, the Creoles, frontiersmen, and free blacks, return to the routine of their daily lives. The Baratarians are granted a full pardon for their smuggling and other transgressions. Though their leader, Jean Lafitte, will forever be identified with the Battle of New Orleans, there are no witnesses who can place him there. As far as Jean Lafitte himself being at Chalmette Battlefield during the engagement we know as the Battle of New Orleans, there is very little proof that says he was there. Um, there is mentions of his people, but no mention of Jean Lafitte. If this famous pirate was at the Battle of New Orleans, why doesn't anybody talk about him? Because he wasn't there. Lafitte will continue his life as a pirate and spy and will be driven from New Orleans when he is caught with booty plundered from an American ship. But it is old Hickory, Andrew Jackson, who undergoes the greatest transformation. This poorly educated orphan of the Revolutionary War, known for his brawling and dueling and quick-tempered acts, soon becomes a national icon. 
to catapult Andrew Jackson into the national spotlight. He becomes a national hero in a war where the United States had so few heroes. Andrew Jackson became its greatest hero. It made him a national celebrity and eventually would propel him all the way to the White House and two of the most important terms of the presidency. Jackson is once again elected as a United States Senator from Tennessee in 1823 and is finally elected President of the United States twice in 1828 and 1832. When Jackson dies in 1845, he has seen the advent of the age of manifest destiny, which he helped to nurture. What's important to remember here in the battle is the fact that it creates something for the Americans that they really haven't had which is more of a national identity. The age of Jackson is born, the age of the common man, the man who can conquer all kinds of odds and go forth, tame the wilderness. It is a victory that Jackson and the men who served there never forget. On the eve of the disbandment of Jackson's army, one artillery captain speaks for them all. Most people say that our American Republic was born the fourth day of July, 1776. This is not true. It was only begotten then. It was never confirmed until the 8th of January. <laughs>